It's been a really exciting past couple of days in the ancient history world because recently the British Museum, they announced the discovery of the most important piece of prehistoric art found in the UK in a hundred years. And it's going on display at their new and upcoming Stonehenge exhibition, The World of Stonehenge. But what is this artifact? Why is it so significant? And what has it got to do with Stonehenge? Well, I'm hoping we can find out. The exhibition is full of amazing objects from across Europe that relate to the era of Stonehenge, 6,000 to 3,000 years ago, including lots of gold. But I've come to see something that at first sight is rather more humble. And here it is, the object that's had so much attention over the past couple of days, this one on the right here. It's smaller than you might imagine at first, but it's packed full of so much detail, so much motif. I mean, look, you can see these kind of triangle rhomboid shapes, but even on the other side, you see so much more because over here, you see all of these ring mark-like designs. It really is a fascinating object to lay eyes upon. It's 5,000 years old, and it's got an even more fascinating story. This chalk drum has never been shown in public before. Its announcement has been a complete surprise to all of us. It was discovered a few years ago during an excavation near the village of Burton Agnes in East Yorkshire. In the centre of a large circular ditch called a barrow, they discovered a poignant group of three children skeletons. To find out more about the dig, I'm catching up with field archaeologist Alice Beasley. Talk me through finding the object itself. Well, we knew, or suspected anyway, that there would be a grave in the centre of the barrow, but we weren't quite expecting what we found. We uncovered the three skeletons and had already realised that this grave was something a little bit special. And then I started cleaning up around the tops of the skulls and the top appeared. And it was very exciting from the moment I uncovered that carved cross with a hole surrounding it. And it just got more and more exciting the larger and the taller that the object got. We couldn't quite see all the detail because obviously it was still pre-conservation. It hadn't been cleaned, but we could tell that this intricate carving was over every surface that we could see. And to be honest, I didn't quite believe it. Brilliant indeed. I mean, when you first uncovered it, you know, that whole process, Alice, what condition was it in? Incredible. It, there was still some of the soil that we were excavating it out of, obviously, on it. And from sort of history of excavating things, I knew, you know, the one thing we didn't want to do was rub that off and reveal the excavation. That way, any, anything preserved on the outside would remain intact. And apart from a very slight crack in the base, which has just occurred over 5,000 years buried, it's in absolutely stunning condition. I'm getting a unique, personal, special tour of the drum with British Museum curator, Dr. Jennifer Wexler. Jennifer, talk to me a bit about the detail of this drum because it's, it's filled to the brim with motifs, isn't it? Yes, it is. It has amazing artistry and quite a few different motifs that we, we see across many objects. For example, on one side, it has these sort of really beautiful sort of swirly designs. And then on the other, it's, it's actually a, a series of geometric lozenges. And on the sides, we get sort of this figure eight butterfly. But as well, at, at the top, interestingly, we get this cross shape, which we sort of describe as a solar cross, which is very early to have that kind of design on an object from this period. This intricately decorated drum was placed very carefully above the heads of the children. Obviously, there was a lot of care and love that went to this burial. Even the way the, the children were placed, they put little sort of rock pillows under their heads and lifted them up. And it's really interesting at this time, we barely have any burials, any inhumations. The only burials seem to be with children. And you get a sense that there's an outpouring of love from the, the local community who buried these people. And they also put these children with one of the most extraordinary objects from 5,000 years ago. Well, leading on to the big question, of course, this drum isn't in this case on its own. You've got these similar items here. How does this new discovery 
relate to these three drums here? So these three drums are called the Folkton drums, and interestingly, they were also buried with a child, but this time just one child rather than three. There's an interesting thing going on with threes in, in a strange way. Three children with one drum, one child with three drums. We're not sure why. At this time, we're, we're not having a lot of burials, so it seems like extra effort is being put into these children's burials. And these drums were found about 15 kilometers away at another site, but they were discovered in the 1880s, so quite a long time ago. And they have some similar artwork, also slightly differences. So we get the sort of geometric designs, and we also, on top of them, we get sort of some of the kind of nice swirls. Other thing that's really fascinating about these objects is that they have these sort of hidden faces. And oh yes, you can see like the little eyes there, yeah. and it's almost like eyebr eyebrows. So, so what is the meaning of these like hidden faces? Well, they're very strange because at this time we don't have figurative art, and we only occasionally have a face that. You know, you almost question yourself, is it a face or is it not a face? But these kind of hidden faces that pop out in certain places, and, and these are some of the few objects where we have that. So perhaps because these were buried with children, perhaps there was, you know, some element of a protective spirit or a companion into, you know, the afterworld, maybe some special connection with an ancestor or even a protective being. We don't know, but it's interesting that they found with this burial and the other really interesting thing, the new excavation, because we never really knew completely when these folked and drums dated to. Yes, exactly. So what can this new discovery reveal about this, these other discoveries made more than a century ago? So based on the style, we always thought these were a little, not quite as old. So we thought they were maybe 4,500 years old. That was always the guess. But because of the new discovery, we're able to do radiocarbon dating. And we know that these are 500 years older than we thought. So 5,000 years old, the question is, what's happening in Britain 5,000 years ago? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting time. It's, it's what archeologists would call the late Neolithic, but really what's happening at that time is a sort of flowering of artistic design. And this, there seems to be a conversation over quite long distances across the British Isles between sort of where you see the beautiful passage grave art in Ireland in the Boyne River Valley, up to places like Orkney and then back down into, into England. And I think the interesting thing about these, all these drums, but particularly th this new drum, is that it encompasses a lot of these designs that we're seeing in lots of other places. So it's a great microcosm for understanding how connected the island of Britain and the island of Ireland was 5,000 years ago. That's astonishing when you think, <laughs> represented through this art. Completely, completely. And also the fact that, that it shows those connections, but also connected to children is pretty astonishing. And basically we, what we're seeing is that there's a kind of shared artistic language, but sort of local versions of it. So it's not completely the same everywhere. It's the people are taking parts of it and then making it their own. And I really like to think of some of the people of this era almost being sort of the earliest geologists. They're going out and finding these amazing stone resources and then making amazing objects out of them. And the most famous of those stone creations is Stonehenge itself, the inspiration for the exhibition. The drum has been dated to the very earliest phase of Stonehenge's building, 5,000 years ago, before the great trilithons went up and around the time when the interior bluestones were erected. In the exhibition, we are using Stonehenge as a gateway to this broader, richer world of 5,000 years ago. And while this site is not directly related to Stonehenge, it's part of the people who were living at that time and the types of things that they were undertaking. So the way that they were, you know, commemorating their dead is a big part of actually a Stonehenge story. We know the earliest stone ring, which is the Blue Stones, dates from the same period of time, so 5,000 years ago. And in that ring, they actually had cremated remains underneath the stones. So they're bringing pieces of their ancestors, literally pieces of their ancestors, and implanting them in the earliest part of Stonehenge. Death and burial is very much a part of the way people are responding and memorializing their place in the world. And also, people really going out of their way to find these special stone materials, things that, materials that meant something to them and that they could use to shape their world in new and exciting ways. And, you know, this is the time when we have early farming and people are literally transforming their world. Um, so this is a way for them to anchor and have places that are meaningful and important to them and also 
mark the seasons and other things that are really significant to the farming year, for example. 5,000 years ago, the British Isles were an interconnected world, with cultural connections running across land and sea. From Stonehenge to Ireland to Burton Agnes and to communities much further north, right up to a group of islands that have become renowned for their Neolithic landscape, the Orkneys, where there's a tantalising connection with the chalk drums from Yorkshire. So Jennifer, we've moved from Yorkshire further north. This is Orkney now, is it? That's right, we've gone north. <laughs> so this is an amazing stone called the Butterfly Stone, and it's from a site called Nessa Brogdor, up in Orkney. This is a huge site in Orkney, isn't it? Especially looking Massive. at Neolithic stuff. Massive, fascinating site. They're still excavating it. They haven't even gotten to the bottom of it because it has so much. Interesting thing about this stone, it was actually destroyed at the last feast. So the, the last great house, which they called the temple, it's really grand on a massive scale. And when they decided to stop using it, they had a huge feast, smashed it all up. So you can see this is smashed in three pieces. Yes, yes, yep. And basically had a massive barbecue with lots of cows and deer and put all the bones on top of the building. It's really fascinating. But the reason why we're looking at this today is because yes. it has these amazing kind of figure eight designs, which you can kind of see there. And there's multiple ones. And this figure eight design you also see on the side of the drum. You can see the similarity there once again. What, what is this telling us there for? It's showing these long distance connections with these artistic motifs. And again, this is, this is clearly a significant motif. It's repeated in many places, but it's interesting to have it on the drum in Yorkshire. It's quite a long distance away from Orkney. So there is again, some kind of conversation happening between these communities over long distances. So not only do you see similarities between those artifacts in Yorkshire and at Stonehenge 5,000 years ago, not only do you see similarities between those drums and activity, in Ireland, yeah. but you also see similarities on Orkney at the same time. Yes. It, it blows your mind, doesn't it? It does. It really does. These ideas are definitely filtering down and moving around. Jennifer, we've seen stone connections, but now we can also see metal connections with the drum too. Yes, interestingly, so I mentioned that on the top of the drum, there's sort of that cross, which we as ascribe to a solar cross. But the strange thing about it is usually we do not see that design until we start to get gold, which is some of the earliest metal work, it's over 500 years later. So we get these lovely discs with the same cross design, which sometimes we call sort of pilgrim badges. And we know that over time, some of the sort of importance of the sun, it moves from being marked by monuments to actual objects, and, and people can kind of wear a portable sun in a sense. And by monuments, are we talking like things such as Stonehenge? It, exactly, exactly. So places where people would mark these kind of important moments in the season, like the solstice or equinox, that seems to s start to go out of fashion as people start to use metal. and they start wearing things that are imbued with the power of the sun and gold is the key to that. Gold is one of the earliest metals that was worked. And so you get these designs, which yes. are crosses, which seem to represent the sun. And you also get these beautiful other objects, which are called lunulas, but they're basically gold collars. And again, they have lovely geometric designs on their edges, but the, the center is sort of left blank to reflect the sun. So the power of the sun is, is really interesting because it's it's put onto lots of different objects. So it's interesting that it's included on our, our drum as well. It's, it's something to do with the way the sun looks. If you look in sort of when it's up high in the sky, you actually get sort of the rays of the sun look like a cross shape. So we think that might be the inspiration for it. But obviously the sun was of key importance to these people. They were farmers and it was part of their livelihood. So we think that's why it was so key to a lot of, a lot of these objects and, and as well as the monuments. This small decorated chalk cylinder, discovered before the pandemic but made public only now, has rested in the ground for 5,000 years, a precious object to accompany three children. Now it has emerged to become a key part of the jigsaw we're slowly piecing together, revealing how people lived, thought and interacted 5,000 years ago. It's an archaeological treasure. So how does it feel now, you know, several years down the line? You know, this object, which you and your team, or you personally, you know, found during it in this burial, has now been labelled the most important piece of prehistoric art found in the UK in the last hundred years, and is about to go on display for everyone to see at the British Museum. It's incredible, it's unbelievable. It, I mean, it's, 
It's a find of a lifetime, you know, you, you see people find these incredible things and they hit the news and you don't believe it'll ever happen to you and now I've spent, you know, evenings after work hearing that people in Canada have heard about it, people in Dubai have heard about it and all over the world about this little find that I made up. And now it's going in the British Museum and I can't wait to see it. So sort of the traditional thing that everybody wants to find is the gold. I still to this day haven't found any gold, however, I think, to be honest, this kind of trumps it. <laughs> After spending time in the inspiring world of Stonehenge, it's really quite strange emerging onto the streets of 21st century London again. Well, there you go, what a fascinating object. 5,000 years old, its story begins in Yorkshire, but it has connections down to Wiltshire and Stonehenge, then all the way to the north in Orkney, right at the top of the British Isles, and then west across the Irish Sea to Ireland. This object, this chalk drum, it might be small, but it reveals a huge story.